Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're glad that you've decided to join us. We hope you understand that we study the Sabbath School lessons prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular lesson is the last in a series entitled The Role of the Church in the Community. Lesson number 13 for September 24 of 2016. And the lesson is entitled, How Shall We Wait? Hmm, that's an interesting question. We hope that you have your Bibles handy because we're going to look at a number of passages. And we'd like to ask you right now to bow your heads with us as we begin with a word of prayer. Our kind and loving Father, it's hard for us to imagine how you must feel about 2,000 years of waiting. We could have finished this whole thing up for so, so, much, so long ago, but here we are, delaying your coming. Help us to wake up to do what we need to do so that you may come soon is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. For several years preceding the 1906 San Francisco earthquake, the Seventh-day Adventist churches in San Francisco and Oakland, California were buzzing. Members were involved in visiting the sick and destitute. They found homes for orphans and work for the unemployed. The, they nursed the sick and taught the Bible from house to house. Members distributed Christian literature and gave classes on healthful living. The churches also conducted a school for the children in the basement of the Laguna Street Meeting House. A working men's home and medical mission were maintained. They had a health food store along with a vegetarian cafe. The members had started ship mission work at the local port and their ministers conducted meetings in the large halls in the city from time to time. That's uh, on your Sabbath afternoon reading for on the, in the Bible study guide, just commenting about what was going on. And that's interesting in light of this additional passage or er, information from Ellen White. About 30 years earlier, Ellen White and her husband James were planning for the building of a house of worship in San Francisco. Some critics felt that their plans were much too large. The church in Oakland and the Pacific Press were being constructed along about the same time. So Ellen White writes, about 30 years ago, she's writing this in 1906, about 30 years ago in 1876 when my husband and I were planning for the building of a house of worship in San Francisco, some, when they saw the plan, said, it is too large, the house will never be, be, be filled. At the same time, we were erecting the first building of the Pacific Press and the Meeting House in, Oklahoma, in Oakland. How great was the anxiety felt, how earnest the prayers offered to God that he would open the way for the advancement of these enterprises. At that time, I dreamed, this is 1876, remember, that I saw two beehives, one in San Francisco and one in Oakland. In the hive in Oakland, the bees were diligently at work. Then I looked at the hive in San Francisco and saw very little being done. The hive in Oakland seemed to be far more promising. After a time, my attention was again called to the hive in San Francisco, and I saw that an entire change had taken place. Great activity was seen among the bees. They were earnestly at work. We prayed much in regard to the necessities of the cause and the meaning of the dream and resolved to venture out in accordance with the light given. My husband and I decided to sell our property in Battle Creek that we might use the proceeds in this work. We wrote to our brethren, sell everything we have in Battle Creek and send us the money at once. This was done and we helped to build the churches in Oakland and San Francisco. And the Lord revealed to us that although at first the work in San Francisco would move slowly, yet it would make steady advancement and San Francisco, San Francisco would become a great center. The Lord would inspire men by his Holy Spirit to carry forward the work with faith and courage and perseverance. Sabbath morning now, November 10, 1900, we entered the San Francisco church and found it crowded to its utmost capacity. That's the one they had built almost 25 years earlier uh, when people thought it was too big. As I stood before the people, I thought of the dream and the instruction which had been given me so many years ago, and I was much encouraged looking at the people assembled. I felt that I could indeed say, the Lord has fulfilled his word. So, considering what was going on there in 1900 and for the years before, do you think that Satan sent the earthquake of 1906 to destroy that work? Well, 
other people would say, did God send the earthquake because of the wickedness in San Francisco? Or did God know that the earthquake was coming, but he, certain ones he did not protect? It's also possible. Or did he, in spite of the earthquake coming, uh, help the work to flourish there in San Francisco? And maybe the devil said, yeah, maybe if we destroy things, maybe they won't be so diligent next time. That's possible. Possible. Lots of different things. Uh, clearly, those are the kind of questions we could ask, and we will never know the answers until we get a chance to ask God himself. It, but we have to say, um, we, I think we would all agree with this, that if God really wanted to prevent it, he could have. So he didn't. He allowed it. Well, the same thing with the with, uh, next quarter, we're going to have the book of Job. Mm -hmm. God could have prevented Satan from doing what he, Satan wanted to do, right? Yeah. And, but he chose not to. And it wasn't because Job was a bad guy. We're, we're off on a tangent here, but uh, I think that, that, that principles from the book of Job has a pretty broad uh, application. Well, Seventh-day Adventists have been waiting more than 150 years for the second coming of Christ. Now, some of you will say, oh, well, he, he, he made a mistake in his math. But remember that the Seventh-day Adventist Church was not organized until 1863, although the Great Disappointment happened October 22, 1844, almost, well, almost 20 years earlier. So the crucial issue for us is, what are we supposed to be doing while we wait? Surely the example of Ellen White and her support of the work in Oakland and San Francisco should give us some ideas. How many Seventh-day Adventists are making serious sacrifices to promote the cause of God? How many thousands of Seventh-day Adventists are there in San Francisco now? Not many. Sounds like there were more in 1906 than in you may 2016. Have to, you may have to take your shoes off to count them all <laughs> on, your, on your digits. I don't know. That. It's not quite that bad. Um, so, what did Jesus say about preparing, about the, how things would be and what would happen near the end of history? These family, famous words, you remember that Jesus left after, after his last day in the temple, which was Tuesday on, on the week before um, Pentecost, I mean, before, I'm sorry, before Passover, and just a few days before his crucifixion. Jesus left the temple and was going away from the temple when his disciples came to him to call his attention to his buildings. Yes, he said, you may well look at all these. I tell you this, not a single stone here will be left on its, in its place. Every one of them will be thrown down. Can you imagine how, that, how the disciples thought, you know, that's impossible. These massive stones, beautiful temple. I mean, why would anyone want to tear it down? Well, as Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him in private. Tell us what, when all this will be, they asked, and what will happen to show that it is the time for your coming and the end of the age. Jesus answered, Be on your guard and do not let anyone deceive you. Many men claiming to speak for me will come and say, I am the Messiah. Have we had any people come and say they're the Messiah? Yes, but there are going to be more and they will, be, they will deceive many people. You're going to hear the noise of battles close by and the news of battles far away, but do not be troubled. Such things must happen, but they do not mean that the end has come. Countries will fight each other, kingdoms will attack one another, there will be famines and earthquakes everywhere. All these things are like the first pains of childbirth. And she goes on. These are very familiar passages to Seventh-day Adventists. Um, So what should we learn from these verses? His four disciples, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, had raised a critical question to Jesus. Sitting on the Mount of Olives, looking across the valley at the beautiful temple. I mean, he's, he's just at eye level. He's looking right across that small valley at the gorgeous temple that you know, seemed imperishable to them. They could not believe that the day might come when all those beautiful buildings would be destroyed. But the real answer to their question is found in Matthew 24, 14. And again, this is a very famous passage that virtually every Adventist must have memorized at some time. And this good news about the kingdom will be preached to all the world 
for a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. Surely reading Matthew 24 gives us some serious thoughts about what is facing us in the future. Well, Jesus doesn't just tell about how they need to be prepared. He goes on to give us several parables. I'm not going to take time to read, up, uh, read all of them, but he, he, first of all, he said, no one knows the day or the hour. You remember that story? Then he talked about the faithful and the unfaithful servant, um, the ones who used their talents and, and multiplied them and the one who didn't. Then the parable of the ten virgins, the ten girls, who were, who were delayed uh, because they didn't have oil for their lamps. Then he talked about the parable, the, I'm sorry, uh, this is the parable of the three servants. And then finally, he talks about the final judgment and how it will take place. So these stories, hopefully, are very familiar to all of us. Let's talk about them. Um, he mentions also Noah, I should, should mention, and the thief who came at night, where Jesus' illustrations for how we must be constantly prepared. The next parable, the parable of the unfaithful chief steward, that's the one that I misquoted there. That's the one where the man was given, forgiven that enormous amount of son, money, and then he's very hard on someone who owed him only a small amount. The parable of the ten virgins, as described in Matthew 25, 1 to 13, is very familiar to us. It is obvious that the point of the story is be prepared. Be prepared. What do we have to do to be prepared? What, what, what was Jesus saying we need to do to be prepared? You need to have the Holy Spirit, the oil. Mm -hmm. Okay. All of, the, all of the ladies went to sleep, but some of them had some extra oil saved away. So we need to be two things. We need to have oil in our lamps, but we also need to be awake, right? Well, and the, the, ta the talents, the, the three servants who are given talents, the 5,000, or the five talents, or the, my translation has 5,000 gold coins, the second one had two talents or 2,000 gold coins, and the third had one talent or 1,000 gold coins. And of course, the, the first two doubled their money. The man with the 1,000 coins or the, the um, one talent just hit it, in, hit it in the earth. What are we supposed to learn from that story? Use your talents. Use your talents. Get them to multiply. So. But Jesus wasn't the only one who talked about the final days, the final judgment, and so forth. There's um, a lot of very interesting material in Second Peter, especially Second Peter chapter three. Look at the first few verses of that book, that chapter. My dear friends, this is now the second letter I have written to you. In both letters, I have tried to arouse pure thoughts in your minds by reminding you of these things. I want you to remember the words that were spoken long ago by the holy prophets and the command from the Lord and Savior with, which was given you by your apostles. First of all, you must understand that in these last days, some people will appear whose lives are controlled by their own lusts. They will mock you and will ask, He promised to come, didn't He? Where is He? Our ancestors have already died, but everything is still the same as it was since the creation of the world. Does that sound at all familiar? Still is, is the there a theory is, of uniformity and Yeah. Is there a reason why people want to reject this book? Um, they purposely ignore the fact that long ago God gave a command and the heavens and earth were created. The earth was formed out of water and by water, and it was also by water, the water of the flood, that the old world was destroyed. Anybody trying to reject that theory or ignoring it? But the heavens and the earth that now exist are being preserved by the same command of God in order to be destroyed by fire. They are being kept for the day when godless people will be judged and destroyed. But do not forget one thing, my dear friends. There is no difference in the Lord's sight between one day and a thousand years. To him the two are the same. What do you think he meant by saying that? No difference between one day and a thousand years? Any idea? 
God's time is different than ours. Okay, God's time is different than ours. Probably meant that God can look forward and backward a thousand years and with full detailed memory just as well as we can remember what happened yesterday. Maybe better. I'm betting better. <laughs> <laughs> the Lord is not slow to do what he has promised, as some think. Instead, he's patient with you because he does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants all to turn away from their sins. And then these incredible words, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. On that day, the heavens will disappear with a shrill noise. The heavenly bodies will burn up and be destroyed and earth with everything in it will vanish. What does it take to burn up the heavenly bodies with a shrill noise? Nuclear energy. Yeah, it would have to be. Have to be, wouldn't it? Since all these things will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people should you be? Your lives should be holy and dedicated to God as you wait for the day of God and do your best to make it come soon. The day when the heavens will burn up and be destroyed and the heavenly bodies will be melted by the heat. Okay. Well, Second Peter is one of the most controversial books in the entire New Testament. There are several very clear prophecies about the future which we must take very seriously, but which critics are very uncomfortable with because they do not believe that even God can predict the future. Peter, inspired by the Holy Spirit, warned us not to be deceived by people claiming that there was no flood and that nothing has changed over long periods of time and by inference that nothing big will change in the future. He told us that we must obey, uh, I'm sorry, we must work to hasten the second coming by studying and obeying the scriptures. He reminded us that God's desire is that everyone will come to repentance so he or she can be saved. So, how should we be, in light of everything we've studied this whole quarter, how should we be working with the Holy Spirit? Or is that the wrong question? supposed to be praying for it to, to help us. Okay. Okay, do we need to go out and do what we think needs to be done and then to ask the Holy Spirit to help us? Is that the way it works? Or is the Holy Spirit supposed to use us? I think it's that. It's, it's, it's kind of a mix, but I think you'd do better with the Holy Spirit helping you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. How does that relationship work? How do we find out what the Holy Spirit wants if we don't start and do something and the Spirit will either bless us or or not? Yeah. Or encourage us or not? Mm -hmm. Well, I would guess that the Holy Spirit's not going to ask me to go and give a big speech somewhere. That's not my forte. I'm going to use the talents that I have and the Holy Spirit will... And, and, and wouldn't it be true that any efforts we can make with our the best talents we have to win people for the gospel that's got to be something the Holy Spirit wants yeah we might come back and say wow I did a lousy job I better do more practice but nevertheless it's an effort in the right direction well clearly a time for revival and reformation are needed what's the difference between revival and reformation we studied that a few weeks ago do you remember what's revival Something close to death, maybe it's been re uh, reviving. Okay. It means, coming, it means basically coming back to life, doesn't it? What does reformation mean? You might be open to some different ideas. Yeah, reformation means you have a new approach to things, isn't it? Yeah, you reform. Well, here's what Ellen White said. A revival of true godliness among us is the greatest and most urgent of all our needs. To seek this should be our first work. How many Adventists are making that their first work? There must be earnest effort to obtain the blessing of the Lord, not because God is not willing to bestow his blessing upon us, but because we are unprepared to receive it. Our Heavenly Father is more willing to give his Holy Spirit to them that ask him than our earthly parents to give good gifts to their children. So how do we ask for the Holy Spirit? Is it just a matter of you kneel down at night time and you say, I want the Holy Spirit? 
You wake up in the morning and there he is. I think you've got to be habitually studying the Word and okay. doing your part to prepare yourself. Okay. Is that reading the Bible, which the Holy Spirit helped give us, or predominantly mm -hmm. He gave us, through inspiring the prophets, and then prayer? The Holy Spirit's single biggest gift, there's no question about that, is the Bible. But reading is not taking it in. It's just reading the words. If you mm -hmm. don't have it in you, well, she goes on to say, but it is our work by confession, humiliation, repentance, earnest prayer to fulfill the conditions upon which God has promised to grant us His blessing. A revival uh, promised, I'm sorry, a revival need be expected only in answer to prayer. That was 1887. So what's the real reason for the delay? There's a very interesting collection of passages found in Evangelism, the book Evangelism, pages 694 to 697. I'm going to pick one of them. Had Adventists, after the great disappointment in 1844, so now I'm going to stop for a second and say, was that Seventh-day Adventists or was that Adventists in general who were looking for the second, looking for the second coming? In general, because there were no Seventh-day Adventists. There were no Seventh-day Adventists at that point. So she says, had Adventists, after the great disappointment in 1844, held fast their faith and followed on unitedly in the opening providence of God, receiving the message of the third angel and in the power of the Holy Spirit proclaiming it to the world, they would have seen the salvation of God. The Lord would have wrought mightily with their efforts. The work would have been completed and Christ would have come ere this to receive his people to their reward. But in the period of doubt and uncertainty that followed the disappointment, many of the Advent believers yielded their faith. Thus the work was hindered and the work world was left in darkness. Had the whole Adventist body united upon the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, how widely different would have been our history. It was not the will of God that the coming of Christ should be thus delayed. God did not design that his people, Israel, should wander 40 years in the wilderness. He promised to lead them directly to the land of Canaan and establish them there a holy, healthy, happy people. But those to whom it was first preached went not in because of unbelief. Their hearts were filled with murmuring, rebellion, and hatred, and he could not fulfill his covenant with them. So, in what sense could God not fulfill his covenants with them? Does that mean he just he's not willing to, or is there some reason why he actually can't? Well, if he were to do so, and they were, they were off doing their own thing, not paying, taking instruction from God, mm -hmm. he would just be rewarding for, and c encourage them to go down the wrong path. So he has to withdraw his protection and let natural results take their course. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, she goes on. For 40 years did unbelief, murmuring, and rebellion shut out ancient Israel from the land of Canaan. The same sins have delayed the entrance of modern Israel into the heavenly Canaan. In neither case were the promises of God at fault. It is the unbelief, the worldliness, unconsecration, and stri strife among God's professed people that have kept us in this world of sin and sorrow so many years. And that was written in 1883. And I'm sure there are many of the few Seventh-day Adventists there were in those days who looked at 1883 and they said, let's see, it's been just about 40 years since 1844. Maybe the Lord will come in 1884. Now we're way past 1984. Wow. We've done a great job, haven't we? Mm. Well, are we, are we guilty of any of those sins she's talking about? Unbelief, worldliness, unconsecration, strife. There's no strife. Pretty close to home. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
What if you if we were to sit down and have a committee? Ideally, we would have a committee of people from all from chosen select people from different parts of the world. And if we could sit down at that committee and say, okay, what's going on in the Seventh Day Adventist Church that's keeping us from being from entering the kingdom of God? What do you suppose they would conclude? The committee like that. Are we asleep like the ten virgins? Probably be like 1888. Could be. Or maybe even worse. <laughs> what do you think? Any idea? Maybe you need to explain the comment about 1888. Well, what I assume you mean the general conference session in yeah, 1888. Yeah, there in Minnesota. There was a famous conference held, actually it was the general conference session of 1888 held in Minneapolis, Minnesota in which uh, there was more fighting and more, more heat than light, and the church has suffered from the consequences ever since. Well, James, to add I to think Ellen White says specifically that the Holy Spirit was rejected at that conference, doesn't she? Something. By the church leadership. I'm sure that's never going to happen again, is it? Hmm. How could that happen? Well, here's what James says. I'm sorry, we're reading lots of passages here. You're going to get tired of hearing me. My brothers and sisters, what good is it for people to say that they have faith if their actions do not prove it? Can that faith save them? Suppose there are brothers or sisters who need clothes and don't have enough to eat. What good is there in your saying to them, God bless you, keep warm, eat well, if you don't give them the necessities of life? So it is with faith. If it is alone and includes no actions, then it is dead. But someone will say one person has faith, another has actions. My answer is, show me how one can have faith without actions. I will show you my faith by my actions. Do you believe that there is only one God? Good. The demons also believe and tremble with fear. You fool. Do you want to be shown that faith without actions is useless? And she goes on to give examples of who and who. We know the answer to that. She uses Abraham and even Rahab. Now, we all pretty much understand why she used the example of Abraham. You what said she several times. What you mean is James. I'm sorry, James. I'm sorry. Why does James use the example of Abraham? Ellen White's referring to it, but here's James, yes. Why does... Why does James pick out Abraham as a great example of faith? All the Jews thought that he was the, well, he was the father of their nation as well as other nations. The father of the faithful, yeah. right? Yeah, and he, he, clear at the end of his life, he was willing to, when God said, take your son out and sacrifice him, he was willing to do it. Amazing. But then Rahab. Why would he mention Rahab? Well, kind of the opposite ends of the same spectrum. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, 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 the spectrum the of good of, faith? Yes. The spectrum of heredity, being in the right, having the right blood in your veins and, and your actions. By the way, um, James, who was he? The stepbrother of Jesus. Okay. His father was from what tribe? Tribe of uh, Judah. A descendant of? David. David. Yeah. And Who was a, defended, a descendant of? Rahab. 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 He's talking about one of his ancestors here. A Moabitess. What? Well, Rahab wasn't a Moabitess, but uh, David was a... Uh, yeah. Rahab was a, was a Canaanite. Yeah, Canaanite. Yeah. Canaanite prostitute initially well we cannot just claim to be Christians we must act <coughs> like Christians the fact that the church exists is because there is a mission not vice versa it's not a case of well we have a church and maybe we should do something no the, the fact that there is a mission is a reason why there's a church here's an interesting something that most of us have probably never known about before. The mission of the Seventh-day Adventist Church as expressed in the General Conference working policy is, and I quote, 
to make disciples of all people communicating the everlasting gospel, the gospel of the kingdom, Matthew 24, 14, in the context of the three angels' messages of Revelation 14, 6 to 12, leading them, this is all people, to accept Jesus as personal Savior and unite with his remnant church, disciplining them, discipling them, I'm sorry, to serve him as Lord and preparing them for his soon return. Preaching, teaching, and healing are the suggested methods to pursue this mission. Under healing, the working policy says, affirming the biblical principles of the well-being of the whole person, we make the preservation of health and the healing of the sick a priority and through our ministry to the poor and oppressed, cooperate with the Creator in His compassionate work of restoration. I don't know how many of you might have noticed, but this last week there was a very interesting article. It was one of the lead articles in, on CNN in the computer, because I just, I don't have time to watch the TV, I just pick up what I can off the computer, saying, surprise of surprises, that eating whole grain uh, um, fruits and vegetables, I mean original natural fruits, and especially grains, whole, whole un, un, unprocessed grains, is healthier than eating meat. Isn't that amazing? Shocking. <laughs> News flash. <laughs> That's what they thought. Some big study said, guess what? You're healthier if you eat whole grain, whole grains. Well, we have a challenge before us. We have a work to do. Are we going to do it? Or are we going to leave it to our children and they won't do it and they're going to leave it to their children and they won't do it? How long can God wait? Is he going to wait another 2,000 years? Or are we going to pick up the challenge? Well, here's the next comment from Ellen White. God is eagerly seeking to produce, this is my introduction to her comment, his character in as many human beings as possible. How does that happen? How does God reproduce his character in us? Spirit of truth works quietly on your mind if you have an interest in it. Remember in John 18, 37, when he's talking to Pilate, he says, I came here to be a witness to the truth. And I'm going to paraphrase the last part of it. He says, truth is only for those who have an interest in it. Mm -hmm. You know, you can give truth to people who are turned off by it and it has no positive impact. Yeah. Well, human beings, all of us, need to go forth in the spirit and power of Elijah to finish the gospel. And here's her comment from Ministry of Healing 143. The world needs today what it needed 1900 years ago, a revelation of Christ. A great work of reform is demanded, and it is only through the grace of Christ that the work of restoration, physical, mental, and spiritual, can be accomplished. So this restoration is supposed to affect us in how many ways? Physical, mental, and spiritual. Every aspect, yeah. <clears throat> well, what do you think about this comment? After hearing a seminar about what needs to be done in our day, one church member made this statement. In our part of the world, we are not very open to new ideas and new ways of doing things. What we have heard this week about following the ministry method of Jesus actually is not new. It's an old idea. We, we just forgot it. Is, is that true? Are there places in the world where there's active evangelism going on? Where, where, where are the places where there's a lot of active evangelism going on? India. India is one of them. Central America. Probably Central America, yeah. China. Except China, quite a bit's happening in China. Parts of Africa. Parts of Africa. Why are the big membership gains taking place in those places and not in North America where the work started. They Are probably we? feel the need over there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Jesus, let's think about the situation now. Jesus in his day lived in what kind of a society? What did people do for a living? Farming. Was that agrarian? They were farmers and fishers and a few were tax collectors and other things like that, but mostly farmers and fishers, that kind of thing. Much of Galilee was inhabited by them. 
Uh, look at R John 4, 34 to 38. Jesus, now this is at the end of which story? The story of Jesus and the woman at Sychar, remember? She was a Samaritan woman, remember? Jesus prophesied to her and told her about her experiences. And then he, she started talking to him and he said, well, I am the Messiah. Well, this, is what, this was the response. You have a saying that now the disciples have come back to the well and Jesus says, you have a saying, four more months and then the harvest. But I tell you, take a good look at the fields. The crops are now ripe and ready to be harvested. What was he talking about? The Samaritans in that area were ready for him. Why? Don't wait. Don't, you don't have to spend four months in no? preparing. What did he do next? What did Jesus do next? Do you remember? He spent several days there. He spent several days in that community and people concluded what? We now believe because of what we have seen ourselves and not just because of what the woman said, right? What does that teach us about how we should be doing things in our day? Where's the large community of Christians in, that were in Samaria at that time? Did, there did, were none. did the church die off? Did the converts? Oh, I mean, are you Jesus, asking where are they now? Yeah, and any time since then. Well, it, it the, the the community grew in the days of Philip and his daughters and so forth, uh, quite quite rapidly. But that remember that pl that place was completely wiped out by the Romans in A.D. seventy. So I'd forgotten about Philip and and his daughters that that worked in Samaria. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Well, Jesus is saying, look, he wasn't talking about the, the, the rye or, or the barley or the wheat or the oats. He was talking about the people who wanted to hear the gospel. And we need to be prepared. When somebody shows an interest in any way, we need to be prepared to speak up and say, let me answer your questions. Let me help you. Let's study together, whatever. Jesus went on to say, the one who reaps the harvest is being paid and gathers the crops to eternal life. So another who sows and the one who reaps will be glad together. The saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I have sent you to reap a harvest in a field where you did not work. Others worked there and you profited, or you profit from their work. The best example I can think of of that was the story of Jesus himself. At the point where he was crucified, how many faithful followers did he have that were, that were known? Well, 11, and there, was, there were some others. One Joseph count, of Arimathea. One count was that there were maybe up to 120. They gathered in that upper room. See. How many were there a few days later after the Pentecost and so forth? Thousands. Thousands. And if we read Acts 6, verse 7 and Acts 15, verse 5, many priests and Pharisees became believers. How many people out there in our communities are waiting for someone to tell them the gospel in a convincing way? Is that what the work of the church is? I'm asking you. The character of Christ is reproduced, is it to say, in the Christ object lesson? Mm -hmm. Well, Jesus knew that in many hearts the sowing process needed to come first. But here were people ready to listen and accept what he had to say and become his followers. We must remember then in farming, different things need to be done at different times. Some might be sowing one crop while others are reaping another. We must never make the mistake of thinking that we know what is in a person's heart. The, you know, unfortunately, this happens. And I, I'm, I'm sorry to admit that it could happen, but this happens. That we may see a certain area and we may look around and we see the kind of people there and we say, well, I'm not sure I'd want them to be members of my church anyway, and we move on. But those people are children of our Heavenly Father just as much as we are whatever their background. 
So we need to do our sewing, and, and we need to keep sewing. A lot of people, not, not by I mean a relatively small percentage are going to pay any attention. There's going to be a lot of people who hear the message, at least initially, they're not going to respond. And what do we need to do? Keep sewing. We have no way of knowing what's in a person's heart. The Holy Spirit is the only one who has that information. We must sow everywhere we have opportunity to do so and leave the results to God. As we know, there is a great controversy going on. And what did Paul have to say about that kind of sowing and reaping and so forth? Remember what it says in 1 Corinthians 3, verse, uh, chapter 3, verses 6 to 8. Paul said, I sowed the seed, Apollos watered the plant, but it was God who made the plant grow. The one who sows and the one who waters really do not matter. It is God who matters because he makes the plant grow. There is no difference between the one who sows and the one who waters. God will reward each one according to the work each has done. For we are partners working together for God, and you are God's field. Okay, well, there's a famous book written by the English author Charles Dickens entitled A Tale of Two Cities. And what was he talking about? London and Paris. London mm. and Paris. But in the Bible, and especially in the New Testament, the two cities that we need to talk about are Babylon and Jerusalem. Babylon and Jerusalem. Right. What do we know about Babylon? It's fallen. It's fallen. Okay. It's a symbol of evil. Okay. What's the single characteristic of Babylon that makes it evil? Do you remember the, the, the bigger picture? There's a, a clear picture in Daniel and Revelation. These beasts that they saw, and, the, and, and then the, in the New Testament, in, in Revelation, the evil happens when the civil. power of the, the civil power, the, the, the military power, combines to enforce the religious doctrine. That's what's evil. Anything done by, through force is anathema to the way God operates. Yeah. You remember the verse in Revelation 14, 8? A second angel followed the first one, saying, She has fallen, great Babylon has fallen, she made all peoples drink her wine, the strong wine of her immoral lust. And you remember that all of Revelation 18, what, chapter 1, I mean, verse 1 to 24 goes on and talks more about Babylon has fallen. By contrast, what do we read in Revelation 21 and 22? Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth disappeared and the sea vanished. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared and ready like a bride, dressed to meet her husband. I heard a loud voice speaking from the throne and, and so forth. Okay? So what we have here is a description of God's bride, his church, his people. At that time, they will have come through terrible times but they will then be enjoying the heavenly bliss. They will have prepared for the least of these, Matthew 25, 40, and then they will be rewarded, they will be reaping the rewards. There's a very interesting um, chapter in Revelation chapter five, and it talks about a scroll that's sealed with seven seals, and it can't be opened. They, even the heavenly council can't seem to find anyone who can open that scroll. Doesn't that seem strange to you? In the heavenly council? And then, lo and behold, the lion from the tribe of Judah, the great descendant of David, managed to open the scroll. And it's a long, it'd be a very interesting discussion if we decide if we could talk about why he could open it, nobody else could. But What's the result? Well, it's interesting to think about, he's now called the lamb, and what did he, where did the lamb go? If we are to follow the lamb wherever he goes, where did the lamb go? To the slaughter, to the cross. To the cross. 
would we be willing to do that in our day? Well, Ellen White goes on to say, the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ himself, appeared and agreed to do, to, to unseal the seals. By his life and his death, he answered the questions in the great controversy and turned the consternation in the heavenly council into jubilant celebration because he said, now we have the answer. And he knows that someday the great controversy will be over and from the minutest atom, these are, this is great controversy 678, from the minutest atom to the greatest world, all things animate and inanimate in their unshadowed beauty and perfect joy declare that God is love. Wow. What Jesus told us about the final events of this world's history is really scary. I have a lot of Adventist friends who say, you know, please just let me, let me rest. Let me sleep through that, those experiences. Should we be looking forward to sleeping through the last days or should we be looking forward to be a, being a members of the 144,000? Is it going to be a pleasant time? It's going to be very challenging. Very challenging. What kind of people are going to survive? Those that are prepared. Those who are awake and those who have oil in their lamps. Remember where we started out? Or Richard Neeswin, he did a, t a series called The Time of the End, A Great Time to Be Alive or yeah. something like that. Yeah. They're not going to be dull. No. They're not going to be Laodiceans then. No. Well, Jesus already won the critical battle in the Great Controversy more than 2,000 years ago. So why isn't it over? And here are the words from Testimonies for the Church, Volume 9. It cost something to engrave those nail prints in his hands. It cost untold agony. If we would humble ourselves before God and be kind and courteous and tender-hearted and pitiful, there would be 100 conversions to the truth where now there is only one. Why is that? Are we, are we so obnoxious that people are turning away? What's the problem? Oh, we're a lot better than the people that she was writing about a hundred years ago, aren't we? Of course, we? of course. <laughs> aren't we? <laughs> you have great aren't insights you? <laughs> <laughs> But though professing, I go on, Ellen White says, but though professing to be converted, we carry around with us a bundle of self that we regard as altogether too precious to be given up. It is our privilege to lay this burden at the feet of Christ and in its place take the character and similitude of Christ. The Savior is waiting for us to do this. Testimonies for the, minister, for the Church, Volume 9, 189, Paragraph 4. And in this much more familiar passage, Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his church. When the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. How does that happen? It is a privilege of every Christian not only to look for, but to hasten the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Were all who profess his name bearing fruit to his glory how quickly the whole world would be sown with the seed of the gospel. Quickly the last great harvest would be ripened and Christ would come to gather the precious grain. Christ Object Lessons, page 69, paragraphs 1 and 2. What does that say to us? Priorities needed to be reordered? Yes. If we're carrying around a big bundle of self, what does that mean? We're not giving of ourselves. The good news is about God and not about yeah. us or the church we, we attend or yeah. belong to. It's, yeah. Exactly. And the, better, the clearer the picture about God, the better he looks. Mm -hmm. The problem is we're kind of hang on to some of those misconceptions that we were raised with and keep perpetuating. 
Are we prepared to allow God to work in our lives to accomplish that goal? Would we be willing to say, God, here's everything I am, everything I own. Use me. What would happen if people were seriously willing to do that? I mean, in the disciples' day, how many were faithful disciples in the upper room at the point where Jesus was being crucified? Not at that point in time, but not too long thereafter, they, they finally got the message and they were, most of them died an unnatural death because of their commitment. So. And even their enemies said they have turned the world upside down in one generation. So, and they had no internet, they had no radio, they had no television, they had no printed word. Even to, to get paper to write, well, their version of paper was very, very expensive and very few people could read. And yet they managed to do that. What's holding us back? Well, think about what you know about the Babylon described in Revelation. And think about the New Jerusalem. Of which city do you want to be a part? What kind of people would you expect to be living in those two different cities? Or dying, as the case may be. What are we doing personally to hasten the second coming of Jesus Christ? Are we just relaxing on the bus, hoping it somehow it'll get us there? You know, Dr. Maxwell used to talk about, you know, here we are riding on the bus, and if it gets a flat, do we do anything? No, we just sit there, wait for somebody else to fix the problem, right? Well, look at Mark 14, I'm sorry, Mark, Mark 4, verses 18 and 19. Other people like the seeds sown among the thorn bushes. These are the ones who hear the message, but the worries of this, about this life, the love for riches, and all other kinds of desires crowd in and choke the message, and they don't bear fruit. Do we know any people who might fall in that category? These are some serious obstacles to certain people to become dedicated Christians. What are some of the obstacles you can think of? The worries about this life, the love for riches, all of the kinds of desires. Does God intend, was it God's plan for us to spend a lot of time waiting for him to come or do we need to be busy? Busy. Well, it is very important to understand the truth about God to the fullest extent possible. But that by itself is not enough. If our beliefs do not change our actions and if our doctrines do not influence the way we live, those teachings have failed. There have been arguments on, among Christians for centuries about the relationship between faith and works in the Christian church. The same tensions have come up in the Adventist church. We do not gain salvation by doing something. That was the problem back in pre-Reformation days. Salvation is by faith alone. What do we mean by that? Salvation is by faith alone? You can't earn it. You can't earn it? What else? The Holy Spirit is willing to come and make the changes in our lives if we are just willing to give Him our time and our attention. But faith impacts our lives because it describes a relationship with God as our best friend. Thus, and I like this expression, faith works. Not faith and works, but faith works. Our actions are not a or the cause of our faith, but rather a result of our faith. And Ellen White said this, the strongest argument in favor of the gospel is a loving and lovable Christian. What does that, and think about that. The strongest argument in favor of the gospel is a loving and lovable Christian. More than 100 years ago now, there was a French acrobat, Jean-Francois Gravelet, better known as Charles Blondin, achieved great fame in the mid-1800s for his spectacular tightrope crossing of Niagara Falls. Stories abound of his confident performances on the 1,300-foot-long tightrope strung 160 feet above the falls. 
without a safety net. On one occasion, he carried a small stove. And I don't know how many of you remember a few years back, there was one of the tightrope walkers that did it. And because it was on TV and he did it live, they insisted that he have a safety. He had a thing on his ankle, with, which is connected back to the, to the thing. But anyway, this guy did it without a safety. Stories abound of his confident performance of the 1,300-foot-long tightrope strung 160 feet, 160 feet above the falls without a safety net. On one occasion, he carried a small stove and utensils on his back, stopped halfway across, made an omelet, and then proceeded to lower the freshly cooked breakfast to passengers on a boat below. Can you imagine that? He also made the crossing on stilts, blindfolded, and in, a sta and, and in a sack. It's estimated that in his lifetime he made the crossing more than 300 times. On one occasion, Blondin reportedly transported a sack of potatoes in a wheelbarrow that he pushed back and forth on the, uh, on the tightrope. He then bantered with the crowd, asking if they thought he could push a person to the other side in the wheelbarrow. Although the consensus seemed to be yes, when he asked for a volunteer, <laughs> Nobody was willing to take him up on the offer. Although the truth of that particular story can't be verified, we do know that he carried his manager across on his back, a feat that he later, at age 65, performed with his son and with another volunteer. Well, are we prepared to get into the faith wheelbarrow? Are we willing to trust our lives fully into the hands of God? Are we willing to commit our time, our talents, even our money into his hands? What is the relationship between our understanding of the great controversy and God's challenge to us to witness. Well, we've, we've, we've read a lot of stuff, James and Matthew and so forth, saying what we need to do. Are we willing to commit ourselves to doing something for God this week? It might be something simple that makes a friend smile. It might be a random act of kindness. It could be a conscious effort to share a bit of the gospel with a non-believing friend. After our series of lessons this quarter, could we do at least that much? What difference would it make if every Seventh-day Adventist did that much? Our kind and loving Father, we thank you for this series of lessons which has challenged us to accept your challenge, to accept and allow the entrance of your Holy Spirit into, your, into our lives so that we may make a difference in our day as the disciples did in theirs is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.